Welcome, my dear students, to my first video lecture for semester one of our two-semester organic chemistry course entitled Chem 2310. I'm Dr. Mike Christiansen, and a chemistry professor from Utah State University, and I'm excited to indoctrinate, <laughs> I mean teach, you about the wonderful world of organic chemistry. And what should you hope to gain from this course? Why, wealth, power, and prestige, of course! No, I'm just kidding. Instead of all of that crap, what you will learn if you listen to and retain all the information that I share over the course of this entire lecture series is the following. One, you'll learn to understand the basic principles of organic chemistry. Two, you'll be able to devise organic syntheses of simple molecules. Three, you'll be able to predict the outcome of chemical reactions discussed in class. And four, you'll be able to determine compound structures using IR, MS, and NMR data. Now our text for this class, or for this YouTube lecture series, for those of you who aren't privileged enough to be taking this from me in person, will be Organic Chemistry 6th Edition by Polly Yurkanis Brewis. Before we begin, however, I'd like to first give you a brief introduction to organic chemistry by teaching you what it is and why it's so important. Organic chemistry is kind of like playing with Legos, trademark. For any of you who've played with Legos, trademark, you might recognize that what you see on the cover of the box is not what you see when you open up the box. So how in the world do you convert all the little pieces inside the box into the actual playset featured? Well, you do it one piece at a time by following this, the instructions, of course. In this particular example, which I stole off the internet, you can assemble this farmer's watering hole for his dog and pig by starting with this piece, to which is added these pieces, to which are added those pieces, and so forth and so on until we finally have the dog and the pig and the farmer next to a watering hole. Isn't that wonderful? I thought you'd like it. Organic chemistry, then, is very similar. Just as we might assemble a complex Lego playset one step at a time by putting simple pieces together, organic chemists assemble complex molecules one step at a time from simple starting materials that can be bought at a store. Unlike Legos, however, Complex molecules can't be assembled using our hands. They're just too tiny. Instead, they're put together by using very specific chemical reactions. Now, just as an example, I'd like to show you guys the assembly of a molecule that I participated in developing back when I was in grad school. Starting with molecule one, which is cheap and commercially available from several chemical supply companies, uh, the research group I was in and I worked and treated it under these conditions to turn it into molecule two. Now, you don't have to understand at all what these conditions are. I just want you to understand that they magically, using organic chemistry stuff that you don't have to worry about right now, turn molecules like one into molecule two. One thing that I want to point out is that this reaction was run in 98% yield. What does that mean? Well, percent yield is a measure of how efficient a particular reaction is. The closer to 100% a reaction's yield is, the less material is wasted each time the reaction is run. Thus, we organic chemists often try to de develop a lot of ways of increasing our percent yields. Now, with molecule two now in our hands on large scale, we reacted it under these conditions to convert it into molecule three. Compound three was then converted to molecule four, and four was converted to five using a special catalyst that I haven't shown here, because honestly, the structure is really big and I don't think it'd fit on this slide. <laughs> Finally, at the very end, molecule five was converted into this molecule shown right here, which is known as esnaproxen, or more commonly, it is commercially known as the pharmaceutical drug Aleve. And just in case you're interested in reading more, here are two publication references for the work that we did on this project. So once again, here's the point. We organic chemists are the people charged with the responsibility of making or synthesizing molecules, which often are medicines. And we do so by using specific structure-altering chemical reactions to convert simple starting materials into complex products one step at a time. Now, many people don't realize that nearly all the medicines that we buy and use as human beings are made by organic chemists, and the processes by which they are made are also invented by organic chemists and chemical engineers. But wait, you might say, don't we get a lot of our medicines from nature? Yes, we do. However, most medicinally useful molecules made by nature are found in such tiny amounts that we can't get enough of them from nature to actually treat disease. 
Hence, natural product chemists discover medicinally useful molecules from nature, and then organic chemists develop ways of making those molecules in large scale in the lab. I'll now illustrate this by telling you a story that involves our molecule of the day. Paclitaxel, which is commonly known as Taxol, shown here, is a mitotic inhibitor used in cancer chemotherapy that is isolated from the bark of the Pacific yew tree. Because it takes about 1.3 tons of yew bark to get 10 grams of Taxol, and doing so kills the tree, an alternative means of developing large amounts of Taxol had to be developed. I hope you understand that. Natural compound found out there, but we'd have to ravage nature in order to obtain enough of it to actually treat any disease. So what do we do? Well, in time, a compound called 10-diacetylbacatin, shown here, was found. It happens to be made by the European yew tree. 10-diacetylbacatin can be harvested from the tree's needles without uh, killing the tree, and they grow back. One thing you might notice if you look at these two is that 10 diacetylbacatin's core looks very, very similar to those of Paclitaxel. So, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, Robert A. Holton, an organic chemist from Florida State University, devised and patented a way of synthesizing Paclitaxel from 10 diacetylbacatin using organic chemistry. This provided a scalable means of making large amounts of this anti cancer medicine for clinical trials. It's been rumored, incidentally, that a good chunk of Florida State's football team budget is paid for by the royalties from this patent, uh, though I don't actually know if that's really true. <laughs> so why do we care about organic chemistry? Well, the most significant reason is that organic chemists use organic chemistry to make nearly every medicine, in part or in whole, that we use as human beings, even medicines that originate from nature. Thus, pharmaceutical companies have armies of organic chemists in their basement laboratories slaving away like orcs to develop the treatments that we use every day. Things like aspirin, oxycontin, Viagra, and liquid joy. <laughs> Note, liquid joy is not a real product. Now, I have to mention that I sometimes find myself feeling frustrated when I visit with medical doctors or dentists who don't seem to understand the role that organic chemists play in their fields. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to accuse all medical doctors and dentists of such ignorance. I did, however, visit with one some number of years ago who tried desperately to persuade me to abandon my dream of becoming an organic chemistry professor and to instead pursue a career in the medical field, which, no offense to doctors and dentists, just isn't my personal cup of tea. To me, that was a little bit like a grocery store owner trying to dissuade someone from becoming a farmer. Frankly, without organic chemists, medical doctors would have to diagnose and treat disease by shaking up bones in a cup. So that takes us to our lecture material for today. I should warn you that nearly all of the material in today's lecture will review stuff that you should have learned back in freshman chemistry. Nevertheless, it is pertinent groundwork for understanding the rest of organic chemistry, so we will cover it. Are you ready then? Good. Let's get started. After today's lecture, you guys should be able to do the following. Distinguish between ionic and covalent bonds. Explain electronegativity. Identify nonpolar and polar covalent bonds. And draw Lewis structures, Kekulé structures, and condensed structures. First, I'd like to start by reviewing the difference between ionic and covalent bonds. You see, when two atoms bond so that they share each other's electrons, we say that they have formed a covalent bond. When two atoms bond so that one completely steals the electrons from the other, more or less, we call it an ionic bond. Here's some pictures that show how electrons spread across three different molecules. Redder parts of those molecules have more electron density. That is, there's greater partial negative charge there. And bluer parts have less electron density, which means that there's a greater partial positive charge there. Our first example, F2, shown here, which is also known as fluorine gas, is formed when two individual fluorine atoms bond together. When they do so, they share their electrons. Thus, we can say that they form a covalent bond with even sharing. In our second example, HF, or hydrofluoric acid, the H and the F atoms also share each other's electrons. 
Unlike F2, however, H and F do not share those electrons evenly. So this is an example of a covalent bond in which there are uneven sharing of electrons. In our third example, LiF, or lithium fluoride, the lithium atom has more or less completely transferred its single valence electron to the fluorine atom. Thus, these two atoms are not sharing electrons. Instead, the fluorine has more or less completely stolen the electron from the lithium. This type of bond is called an ionic bond because there's a complete transfer of electrons, leaving two individual ions, a lithium positively charged cation, and a fluoride negatively charged anion. As mentioned, when covalent bonds form, sometimes the atoms in those bonds share their electrons evenly, and sometimes they don't. So what determines the degree of sharing? Electronegativity. And what is electronegativity? Electronegativity, simply defined, is an element's thirst for electrons. The more an element wants to steal electrons to feel like a noble gas, i.e., obtain a full octet, the more electronegative that atom is. Electronegativity increases as you move up and to the right on the periodic table. Noble gases, the elements found in column 8 of the periodic table, are excluded because they have very little thirst of electrons because they already have a full octet. Thus, the most electronegative element on the periodic table is fluorine, and the least electronegative atom is francium. This brings us to an impromptu lecture question. Which atom in each of the following pairs is the most electronegative? Now, I'm not going to answer this question for you, but will instead let you ponder and answer it for yourself. This is, of course, an excellent exercise to determine if you can identify trends in electronegativity. As I've already foreshadowed, when two bonded atoms have an electronegativity difference, the more electronegative atom will hog electrons like this. In this example, chlorine is much more electronegative than hydrogen, thus the chlorine pulls electrons to itself much more strongly than the hydrogen does, kind of like a tug of war between a monster truck and a Volkswagen Beetle. This uneven sharing of electrons results in a partial positive charge on the hydrogen and a partial negative charge on the chlorine. This charge difference is called a dipole. The greater the difference in electronegativity between two atoms, the more unevenly they share electrons and the more polar their bond will be. We can often say then that bonds with dipoles, that is uneven sharing of electron, have dipole moments. We can draw a dipole moment in two different ways. One way is by drawing a partial positive charge next to the atom that has a partial positive charge and a partial negative charge next to the atom that is more electronegative. Another way is to draw this, this little arrow pointing toward the more electronegative atom, the one that is hogging the electrons to itself more, indicates that the electron density is more heavily uh, accumulated on that atom. Covalent bonds with dipoles are called polar covalent bonds, and covalent bonds that do not have dipoles are called nonpolar covalent bonds. So this takes us back to our original slide here. As you can see, when two atoms have an even sharing of electrons, they have a nonpolar covalent bond. This happens when they have little to no difference in electronegativity, as occurs in F2. When two atoms have a more when two atoms have a more significant difference in electronegativity between them, they unevenly share electrons. This is called a polar covalent bond. And lastly, when two bonding atoms have a really significant electronegativity difference, one atom will completely transfer its electrons more or less to the other and form an ionic bond. We might consider ionic bonds then to be kind of like extremely polar covalent bonds. This occurs most often when an atom from the right side of the periodic table bonds with an atom from the left side of the periodic table. Because they have such an extreme difference in electronegativities, they will form an extreme dipole, in essence a complete transfer of electrons from one atom to the other, giving an ionic bond. This brings us to another impromptu lecture question. Arrange each of the following sets of bonds in order of increasing polarity. And question two, 
which of the following bonds has a dipole? For those that have dipoles, on which atoms do the partial positive and partial negative charges lie? Once again, I'm not going to answer these questions for you, but we'll let you instead ponder and answer them for yourselves. We now move to a different subject, that of Lewis structures. Back in general chemistry, we learned how to draw Lewis structures. Now, I expect you to know how to do this, but I will not give a thorough review here. Instead, I will just summarize the steps, give you some example problems to practice with, if you wish, and provide some helpful links to online tutorials on the subject. If needed, please review section 1.4 of our class text. So here are the steps for drawing Lewis structures. One, add up all the valence electrons for every atom in the molecule. If there are any anions in the molecule, add one electron to the total number for each negative charge. For cations, subtract one electron from the total number for each positive charge. Don't worry about which electrons came from which atoms. Only worry about the total number. Two, write the symbol for all the atoms in the molecule showing which atoms are attached to which. Then connect them with a single bond uh, or a dash which represents two electrons. Chemical formulas are often written in the order in which the atoms are connected. In many polyatomic ions, the first atom in the formula is the central atom in the Lewis structure. Usually, but not always, the central atom is the less electronegative atom. Three, complete the octets around all the atoms bonded to the central atom except for hydrogen, which only wants two electrons around it. Four, place leftover electrons on the central atom even if doing so results in more than an octet of electrons around it. And five, if there are not enough electrons to give the central atom an octet, try multiple bonds, such as double or triple bonds. You got that? All right. Here are some more lecture questions on the subject. Question one, construct a Lewis structure for O2 in which each atom achieves an octet of electrons. Two, explain why it's necessary to form a double bond in the Lewis structure of O2. And three, Draw loose structures for each of the following molecules. And here's another question. The Lewis structure for the carbonate ion is what? Now, Once again, I'm not going to answer these questions, but will instead let you answer them for yourselves. We'll now finish this lecture by briefly introducing you to two different subjects, Kekulé structures and condensed structures. In Kekulé structures, bonding electrons are drawn as lines, and lone pairs are usually left out unless needed for some special reason. Here are some examples. We often draw simplified structures by omitting some or all of the covalent bonds and listing the atoms with subscripts like this. These types of structures are called condensed structures. The condensed structures shown here correspond to the Kekulé structures that I showed in the previous slide. And now I finish by showing you some more lecture questions on this subject. Question number two from our problem set. The Kekulé structure of pentane is shown here. Draw its condensed structure formula. Question three. Write a Lewis structure for the following molecule, CH2CO. And question four. Draw Kekulé structures of the five different isomers of C6H14. Well, that brings us to the end of this lecture. Please stay tuned for our part two lecture on electronic structure and bonding, which will be posted shortly. Until then, have an enjoyable day.